All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Metzog's Neuroanatomy Lecture Series, where we talk about what you should know before going to the anatomy final. My name is Toa, and our topic for this lecture is brain vessels and blood brain barrier, brain dysfunctions related to inadequate blood supply via particular blood vessels, brain damage due to vascular occlusion. In other words, stroke. I'll be discussing about the basic anatomy of brain vessels and blood brain barrier, and my friend Erfan will guide you through what happens if things go wrong with those vessels. So essentially, our brain is a very energy hungry organ. It constantly requires glucose and oxygen and other nutrients as well for its metabolism and function. And it lacks its own storage of these nutrients. So it's getting like 15% of our precious blood pumped out by heart every minute. So it's a lot. There, so then the blood supply to the brain is very crucial. And there are essentially four arteries that supply the brain or that goes into the brain. Two internal carotid arteries and two vertebral, vertebral arteries. So internal carotid artery begins from the carotid bifurcation. It enters the skull via carotid canal in temporal bone, as you might have known from the, the skull, skull test in the winter semester. It will go through the petrous part of the temporal bone, cavernous sinus, and it gives its terminal branches, which is anterior cerebral arteries and middle cerebral arteries. Or you can say that it joins the circle of villus, and we'll discuss about the circle of villus in a minute. Vertebral arteries, on the other hand, starts from the subclavian arteries and enters the transverse foramina, usually at the level of cervical vertebrae sixth. Through transverse foramina of cervical vertebrae, they enter the skull via foramen magnum. Now there is already a question about the drainage system of the brain, so I'll not go into deep, uh, deep, but I'll just mention a few. Main vein that drains the brain is internal jugular vein that starts from jugular foramen. Some of the venous blood drains into pterygoid plexus and even small fraction of venous blood is drained by emissary veins of the skull into the occipital vein. In some cases, since angular vein of the facial vein is connected to cavernal sinus, via ophthalmic vein, venous blood may be drained by facial vein as well, but only some of the cases and not usually. Right. <clears throat> some of the CNS structures is supplied before the ICA or internal carotid artery or basilar artery flows into the circle of villus. Pituitary gland receives its arterial supply, for example, from the ICA and most of the brainstem is supplied by the branches from the basilar artery. The circle of willis is made up of six important arteries and communicating arteries mainly. Important branches here are the anterior cerebral arteries, middle cerebral arteries, and posterior cerebral arteries. And it will be a lot helpful if you remember the image of these anastomoses and at least draw major ones on the paper during the exam so that professor might give you easy time, easier time with that image. So with this picture in your mind, let's discuss first about the branches of internal carotid artery. On both four parts of the internal carotid artery, right now we're interested in the cerebral part. Branches of cerebral part of thalamic artery posterior communicating artery, which communicates ICA with basilar artery, anterior cerebral arteries, and anterior choroidal arteries, and it continues on as the middle cerebral artery. Okay, so ACA, an, or anterior cerebral artery, it gives its first branch to the anterior communicating artery, to an with contralateral ACA. It ascends and winds backwards along the corpus callosum, giving off many branches along the way to supply the medial portion of frontal lobe and superior medial portion of the parietal lobe, as you can see in the image on the bottom. 
that supply area extends to the supply area of the posterior several arteries, which we'll cover in a minute. MCA, or middle cerebral artery, gives branches first to the anterolateral central arteries to supply the inner brain regions, such as basal nuclei or basal ganglia, if you prefer, and part of the internal capsule. Uh, if you don't know what we are talking about, please refer to lectures dedicated to these legion of the brain. It then travels laterally to lateral fossa, as you can see on the image on top. Uh, it goes along with the lateral sulcus and then gives its terminal branches and supplies a superficial cortex area of the lateral part of the brain. The vertebral arteries and basilar arteries. Intracranial part of the vertebral arteries gives, give off few branches that supply cerebellum and medial vongata, which is posterior inferior cellular artery for the cerebellum and anterior spinal artery. The vertebral arteries join at the level of gap between pons and medulla of vongata, and there begins the basilar artery. Be careful, there's only one basilar artery. So basilar artery runs up in the middle of the pons while giving off the branches to supply pons and cerebellum. It eventually splits into the posterior cerebral arteries. So PCA or posterior cerebral artery runs posterolaterally to supply the mesencephalon and travels backwards to the occipital lobe. It terminates at the posterior cortex, giving off the terminal branches to supply them, as you can see in the picture in the presentation. So it's mainly responsible for the posterior part of the um, brain. So let's recap for a little quick. ACA, or anterior cerebral artery, mainly supplies the medial portion of the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe whereas MCA, or middle cerebral artery, is mainly responsible for a lateral part of the brain, and the posterior, art, posterior cerebral arteries is mainly responsible for the posterior part of the brain. Okay, so this will be my final topic to talk about, and then my friend will carry on with the topic of stroke, the blood-brain barrier. As you might have studied in histology, it is a barrier consists of endothelial cells, vasolamina, lamina, and the food process of the astrocytes. Remember, this is very important. Endothelial cells, vasolamina lamina of these endothelial cells, and the food process of astrocytes. So its function is to be selectively permeable to substances in the blood and in the brain. For example, we want these oxygens and glucose to enter the brain, but on the other hand, we don't want some toxins or drugs or some bacteria to enter the brain. There are some exceptions where the permeability of the capillary is much higher than what we've discussed for the purpose of chemical detection of the substance in the blood or and secretion of certain hormones, such as melatonin release from the pineal gland into the systemic circulations and passage between the portal circulations of pituitary gland and systemic circulation at the median eminence and so on. Now my friend Arfan will continue on with you about the topic of stroke, what can go wrong and what can you see on the patient. Hello everyone, my name is Erfan. We will go through a final question of yours, which is brain dysfunctions related to inadequate blood supply via particular blood vessels and also brain damage due to the occlusions. So <clears throat> this looks like a quite big and intimidating subject, but it in fact is just <clears throat> as simple as definition of the stroke and also consequences of the stroke and 
what happens when there is a specific vessel on which undergoes a stroke so let's dive into it uh, this is just a, a general scheme of uh, of the like the biggest vessels of the cerebrum and also which areas they perfuse or in fact they kind of supply blood to so as you could see we have made middle cerebral artery which is, this is just a an, an approximate uh, kind of scheme it's good for revision so here we can see middle cerebral arteries supply here anterior cerebral artery posterior cerebral artery and it doesn't mean that these areas are only innervated by these vessels well i know that you have you have had for sure lectures uh quite detailed about the blood supply of each area of the brain it's just a general scheme of have an idea so i'm not gonna just waste much time on it so what is a stroke stroke is a disruption in the cerebral perfusion so what is perfusion perfusion is supplement of blood by the vessels so whenever there is no blood whenever there is no perfusion there's going to be ischemia so ischemia you might ask what is ischemia ischemia is the cell death in fact so when there is no blood, there is no oxygen exchange, there is no glucose coming to the cells, there is like no metabolism, so we call them ischemia, which is aka cell death. And the, uh, these strokes can not just be because of the ischemias, it could be because of the hemorrhages, of course. So there are some risk factors, for example, Hypertension are one of the most common risk factors of ischemia and the hemorrhagic strokes because they tend to mess with the uh, walls of the blood vessels and arteriosclerosis, you're gonna have it next year and the year after. So, the, in fact, they're like, So like uh, they get sedimented, there there's some particular materials, for example, lipids, cholesterol, etc. I'm not going to get into the details, getting sedimented into the wall, making them narrow and cause other consequences. So for now, just know hypertension are one of the main risk factors. So generally, generally, if you want to think about stroke as a general thing, without giving a detailed, detailed explanation, we should expect these particular symptoms. Hemiparesis, which is weakness of half of the body, very common. Paresthesia, what is paresthesia, you might ask? It's the abnormal sensations that patient might feel, such as abnormal sensations of tingling, prickling, and hemianopsia, which is losing the vision, losing half of the visual field which we will get into it later on. So, we will go into the patterns of and clinical features based on each vessel. So, the explanation here is specifying, in fact, what happens when there is stroke in particular vessels. Like, for example, let's say, middle cerebral artery, I don't know, anterior cerebral artery, and we will get into them throughout this presentation but the main the key to know what would be the consequences of each stroke we need to think about where that particular blood vessel supplies in the brain so ischemia or stroke of that particular vessel would cause the defects of the areas that it's supply in the brain and their function in the body. So, as a start, let's look at the middle cerebral artery. So, as we can see here, we have the middle cerebral artery here. It is circled with this red circle, and it's a branch of internal carotid artery. And this middle cerebral artery 
is the most commonly affected vessel by stroke. That's a pretty high yield point to remember. And it also branches off, it gives lenticular striae branches, which they kind of penetrate deeper into the brain and give off branches to basal ganglia, uh, which we will see in the next slide. And also, not only that, it also gives off more branches such as superior division, inferior division, which are the, the superficial kind of um, divisions of this particular vessel. And also it has deeper, deeper uh, branches as well. So what are the symptoms that we expect upon a stroke of this particular vessel, middle cerebral artery? So, we will have weakness and the sensory loss most marked in upper and upper limbs and lower half of the face uh, which and also in lower limbs but they usually not mention it because it's not that I would say markable as upper limbs and the lower half of the face also also, uh, we will have expressive aphasia. Aphasia means they would, the patient would unable to speak, so and unable to like make voices, which makes sense. So, why is that? You might ask because this artery supplies broca areas in the brain. So when it gets affected and usually the dominant hemisphere is affected so it could have consequences such as aphasia and uh, another symptom which is quite interesting is the hemi neglect contralateral hemi neglect in which the patient is pretty unaware of the symptoms of the sorry uh, of the stimuli which are happening in their surrounding which involves their contralateral non-dominant hemisphere so they would be quite clueless about what's happening sensory stimuli around them and you can see here the Wernicke aphasia is also mentioned uh, it occurs due to the lesion to superior temporal gyrus why because superior temporal gyrus is also supplied by the middle cerebral artery inferior division which is right here visible in the picture so the next very important branch of the middle cerebral artery is as I mentioned in the last slide these deeper branches these branches which is circled in purple they're penetrating arteries their main supply is lenticular, lenticular nucleus and the striatum in the basal ganglia. So you could imagine what would be the symptoms based on uh, functions of the lenticular nucleus and the striatum and the basal ganglia as a whole. So if, if the area which is supplied by the lenticular striate ar lenticular straight arteries are an internal capsule it could cause motor stroke and paralysis of the patient so motor dysfunctions what happens when it when the branches that are supplying thalamus gets disrupted so sensory stroke pure sensory stroke why because of the function of thalamus what about the basal ganglia itself in general Parkinsonian like disorders like patient has tremor and they don't have control on their movements etc and you can see here that there is this table with details of location and the clinical features of what happens if there's a disruption in, in each location if you would like to refer to later on but the main symptoms and the high yield ones are those that are already notes and I mentioned internal capsule, thalamus and basal ganglia.
So let's look at the anterior cerebral artery occlusions. As we can see here, this is the anterior cerebral artery and the branches which get subdivided and it goes anterior and then posterior deeper to the brain. So what areas does this artery cover? So this artery uh, mainly supplies prefrontal cortex and also supplementary motor area. So you can see here there is the in this, in this picture there's the pre prefrontal cortex and the prefrontal cortex is in charge of mostly personality and decision making so if there's a disruption in this area it could cause abulia abulia is the scientific term of patient not being able to make decisions or like acting in a way that makes sense in case of decision making or disruption the personality the other area which it supplies is a supplementary motor area here marked in purple and disruption to this area could cause uh, mainly a aphasia which is the also problem in, in speech and also changing between the motor and sensory behaviors. Uh, sorry, sorry, between the motor behaviors. And also the micturition, which is uh, urinating, I would say, it's a, aka urination, micturition. Inhibiting area is also situated here. So in case of any disruption, uh, the patient will use the... the uh, they will be lose the consciousness of urination so there would it's called the urinary incontinency and the last one is paracentral rubule and uh, disruption and damage could cause sensory and motor disruptions of the contralateral lower limb Uh, then it will cause paresthesias and hemiparesthesias in the contralateral lower limb. And in this slide, you can see some of the symptoms that I've already mentioned in a nutshell. So let's speak about the posterior cerebral artery here. The posterior cerebral artery supplies thalamus and parts of the midbrain mainly. Well, it has deep branches and superficial branches, and these are the deep branches which supply the thalamus and the parts of the midbrain. Here you can see a couple of schemes, a couple of useful schemes of in it would be useful in understanding the supply of this vessel. As you can see, it supplies the occipital lobes, supply inferior temporal lobe, also thalamus and also midbrain. And as you can see here, it's one of the branches of the basilar artery. And in this picture, you can see that it also supplies the splenium of the corpus callosum. So, we should think now, what happens if there is a damage of posterior cerebral artery in each part of this area that it supplies? So... Superficial branches of this artery supply occipital lobes, splenium of the corpus callosum, inferior temporal lobe, and parts of the parietal lobe. So, in case there is disruption of the blood vessel and occipital lobe, there's going to be contralateral homonymous hemianopia. So, hemianopia is disruption in the visual field, and also Anton syndrome. Anton syndrome. Well, it's a there's a lots of details about it, but the thing that you need to know is that it's just is the situation in which the patient uh, denies that he he or she has lost their visual field. So although they have lost their vision, they would deny it. So they're not aware of their vision being lost. The disruptions and the strokes in the part that supplies thalamus could cause 
contralateral sensory deficits as most of the uh, as most of you know the thalamus uh, has a very huge role in sensory uh, stimuli and also when there is the splenium of the corpus callosum the part that causes splenium of the corpus callosum when it gets disrupted blood supply it could cause alexia alexia is a kind of scientific term medical term for a state of the patient in which patient can write but cannot read and this slide is a summary of what we just talked about about the symptoms of a stroke in the posterior cerebral artery so next on we have posterior inferior cerebellar artery as one of the important blood, uh, blood supplies there is a purple circle around it here on the scheme you can see and you can see the further branches that it gives as it goes through the cerebellum so what would be the symptoms of cerebellar inferior cerebellar artery being disrupted or a stroke so we have we could ex expect, expect two types of symptoms one of them is ipsilateral symptoms and one of them are contralateral symptoms to the if we sum up all the symptoms there is a syndrome called wallenberg syndrome which is pretty famous in neurology and it's sum up the when they you sum up the symptoms that are mentioned here uh so we get dysphagia why is that due to involvement of the nucleus ambiguous and the symptom is characterized mainly by inability of the patient to swallow or difficulty swallowing it could disrupt the gag reflex it could cause dysphonia hoarseness problem problems in uh, producing voice and also speech because also due to the involvement of nucleus ambiguous it could cause ataxia basically ataxia is unenabled patient being unable to control the muscle movements or coordinate the muscle movements because of the because of problems in the cerebellum it could be hemorrhages it could be blood vessel it could be trauma anything anything wrong in cerebellum could cause ataxia which you could just as a uh, not a medical term you can just mention it as a like clumsy clumsiness and un uncoordinated muscle movements so if cerebellar peduncle is involved we could expect ataxia loss of pain and temperature feeling in the face and a contralateral symptom uh, we could mention loss of pain and temperature in trunk and limbs because the spinothalamic tract is also involved and as a basal artery occlusion since it's a very quite big artery with quite uh, quite a few branches we're just not gonna we're not gonna deep dive into the uh, details of it it's just a quite short overview uh, so what happens is that you could lose consciousness but it is preserved the reticular activating system is not affected and uh, it could cause vertebral basilar insufficiency the common symptoms are vertigo tinnitus dysarthria dysphagia uh, cranial nerve deficits also diplopia ataxia again and paresthesias and in the end, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I hope this presentation would be useful, guiding your way through studying this question, and I wish you best of luck to, through your exams and finals.